anyway, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Phil Erickson, is going to talk about uh, the, uh, the 50 megahertz. It says right here, you know, uh, upper level lows and 6 meter 50 megahertz um, phenomenon. And this is an area, there was a lot of active uh, interest in this part of the ionosphere up until the 70s, and everybody got enamored of satellite stuff, and so a lot of geophysical uh, research sort of died out. But the phenomena are still there, and now the interest is building again, and uh, there's a lot of interest in this uh, low VHF, uh, 50 megahertz. In particular, I'm going to go back online here. So, um, I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Bill Curtis. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, you know, the court has no stock sales, no mine, why am I here? Um, we'll go uh, we'll over that a little bit later. Um, but actually, my point is what I'm about to present to you is actually a science investigation that anybody in this room would have done. And um, so, one of the things that we're trying to do with this particular AMSI initiative is to connect you all to people like me spend their life studying the ionosphere and the nearest space environment. And I think together we can do a lot of really good science. So um, my friend Joe Jokovic, uh, who is a ham in uh, Massachusetts area, was not able to be here, but he very kindly allowed me to present this on his behalf. And so the work you're going to see here is all his. I am just going to put it in a little bit of context. So uh, I'm going to um, so, just a little introduction, um, I'm going to tell you what started this investigation for Joe. Um, Carl mentioned a little bit about sporadic heat, which is a very interesting subject for the professional ionospheric people who like to do um, In addition to those of you who get to use it in an applied sense, where you get to make long distance contacts on six meters. And so, um, Joe has discovered some interesting things which actually we're trying to follow up on scientifically, so I want to describe that and then I'll describe a little bit of his observations. Um, so, this is Joe, K1YOW. He is a retired reliability engineering fellow. He's been licensed since 1962, so he's been doing this for a little while. Um, that's Joe right over there. And um, like I mentioned, he lives in Harvard, Massachusetts, and uh, which is kind of out in the Boston area, kind of along the 495 is, if any of you know the area. And uh, Joe will tell you his station is modest, so he's using, a, as you can see, a PS950 SG. Also has an IC746 Pro, 100 watts into a seven band uh, off center feed dipole, which you know, we'll comment later about how simple that is really cool enough. But he's a curious guy, and I know there's a lot of curious people in this audience, otherwise, you wouldn't be here. And I want to show you where curiosity can be. And um, he actually used propagation predictions way back in the 1960s when he was actually at Raytheon where he came from before he retired. Here's his email, and these slides will be up, and I encourage you to ask him questions about what we're going to hear. Uh, you can ask me too, but, uh, you know. So this is the Stockdale answer. So this is me. Um, I'm an assistant director of a place called MIT Haystack Observatory, which is again in the Boston area. Uh, we've been doing fundamental radio science investigations since 1956. <laughs> Um, and um, I got licensed last year. So I have actually been in the ionospheric field for about 35 years now. Um, but thanks to Nathaniel here, I decided that there was an interesting community here that I was missing a great opportunity to collaborate. So um, I belong to the Neshoba Valley Amateur Radio Club, which are our neighbors in Brock, Massachusetts, next door. And my goal in being here actually is to help forge more links between you guys in the audience and professional ionospheric researchers. I think there's a tremendous amount of science we can do here. By the way, just to tell you, these are the antennas that I have. <laughs> Which is not the subject of this presentation. Um, I'm actually the principal investigator for this 150-foot fully steerable antenna and this 220-foot unit pointing antenna connected to a UHF megawatt transmitter in that building. The, the, the transmitter was used to detect Sputnik 1 of the <coughs> two days after it was launched on October 6, 1957, when the measurement was made. So we've been there for a while. 
I have big toys. But that's not what this presentation is about. Just to point out some context. So this is what started Joe's investigation. Joe really likes to use 66 meters. Magic band, my understanding is. That's a common phrase. And in the spring of 2016, last year, um, this was a typical six meter day. If you just looked at the propagation reporting, you see all, and say like six meters, you see all these contacts over here in Europe, and sadly in North America, where Joe was located, nothing. And that got Joe curious, as all of you can be curious, and started to look into sporadic E and what might cause it to be. And it turns out that there have been some scientific investigation in this, but as you're going to find out, we don't know nearly as much as we should. Um, so, sporadic E, also abbreviated S, which I will do sometimes to say um, space. They're essentially phenomena of the ionosphere, and particularly E region, which is, E stands for electrified, by the way, when Carl mentioned the heavy side layer back in the 1920s. The, you know, the hypothesis, there must have been a reflecting layer for us to be able to see. Uh, signals beyond the horizon. That layer, it turns out, is about 100 kilometers. It's in the E region. It's there during the day and it disappears at night. And there sometimes, in this particular region here, can be really sharp layers, not just a nice smooth bearing curve, that show up in the daytime, it, it, particularly at mid-latitudes, in the summer hemisphere, wherever it's summer. And essentially, they're just enhanced electron density, very sharp compared to the background ionization. As Joe mentioned, this is a typical altitude range, you know, about 60 miles if you want to, we all use this metric, but if you want to use English, that'd be about 60 miles. They're not very thick, they're, they're about maybe a half a kilometer to five kilometers, and they don't, sometimes they're very, very localized spatially too, or they can extend over a thousand kilometers. They're interesting. And so we are really interested in looking into this more, and it turns out that one of the major theories, and we people have flown rockets through these things and have looked at the, uh, what's there, is having to do with the fact that the, ions, the atmosphere has two parts. There's the neutral part, which is the part you're breathing right now, and the ionized part. And as we go up in the altitude in the, uh, in the atmosphere, <coughs> the neutrals begin to fall off and the ions begin to come up, because now you've got extreme ultraviolet photons penetrating and those are ionizing the atmosphere. And there are winds up there, just like there are winds down on the ground. We don't know that much about the neutral winds, frankly, because you can't bounce a radio wave off them, so they're rather hard to measure. But they can have very, very strong shears, it turns out. If you fly a rocket through them, you watch the wind start whipping all over the place when you get out there. Um, and as Carl mentioned, we have a lot of meteoric dust that's input into the atmosphere, and these are really heavy metal ions. This is iron, magnesium, calcium, um, potassium. And they can, the winds, because they have a shear, so down here, lower in altitude, they're going to the east. And then up here, they suddenly switch to the west. And so any of the ions that get deposited by meteors get pancaked and made into these really thin layers. And the electrons follow, because there's the, the positive, where the positives go, the electrons tend to follow. And so you get electron density, really sharp layers. That's one thought about what causes sporadic E. But this mechanism critically depends on what the wind shear is doing. Okay, if the wind is nice and smooth, you're not going to pile up that ionization. And those are quite variable. Maybe one of the reasons why sporadic E is in the summer. So when Joe looked into this a little more, this is a global map, for example. Winter time, spring, summer, and autumn. And the red is higher percentage occurrence rate of sporadic E. The blue is lower, and you can quite easily see which hemisphere has summer. Here we are winter and it's summer in the southern hemisphere. And here we are summer in the northern hemisphere. Okay? And so yes, in fact, the sporadic E tracks which season it is. You also notice that there isn't too much of it at equinox. Uh, you know, uh, when the day length is equal on both sides of the equator. Um, so Joe found this in a couple of papers and uh, said, okay, well, now I'm learning more about sporadic E. This is interesting. And then he noticed his problem that there's a lot of blue where North America is, even, um, at, even in the summer, right here. And so, hmm, why is there blue there? I mean, you know, there's many years going in there all the time. Why would there suddenly be no sporadic E there? But there's sporadic E in Europe, where, where Joe doesn't live. Um, so, why do we see that? Well, it turns out that people like the folks in this room, other people who just watched when they see these long propagation paths of 50 megahertz and when they don't, happen to have noticed that some of these opens need near to near our lower altitude weather patterns, like the weather that we're living with 
the rain, what have you, larger weather patterns seem to alter the pattern of where you see this propagation. So Joe said that that had explained what I just saw on that map. So he, like good scientists, proposed a hypothesis which says maybe sporadic heat also depends on what the regular lower atmosphere weather is doing in a region as well as what's happening with these wind shears at upper altitudes. So there's his theory. Could he see this using observations? So he tried. So here's June 13th, 2016, so about a year ago. Um, there was a double hop between uh, across the Atlantic between US and Europe. And so Joe went to the web and found this, which is basically the lower atmosphere weather pattern. I'm only showing you winds at one particular altitude just for simple sort of things. And during that particular day, there was a nice low pressure system that was right off the coast of North America. There was also another nice low pressure system that was over the coast of Europe. And now I'm going to show you the propagation. Notice. Okay. So he said, hmm, maybe, again, correlation is not causation just because I've shown you two things that are correlated. Doesn't quite yet mean that they're one is causing one another, but there's certainly an interesting bit. There's an interesting bit of um, data there. Now I'm showing you propagation network data. Right? Let's go to look at another view. Now let's go back to the neutral atmosphere. New England, Europe, the upper lows are basically sitting right off the coast. So you can imagine a double hop scenario where you've got a patch of sporadic heat here, a patch of sporadic heat here. Things go up, come back down up again and end up in Europe, and that's maybe why those propagation paths open. So Joe got on the radio, and he did this. He worked quite a number of stations <coughs> in Europe on CW, and one day earlier than that, he worked 35 stations in two and a half hours on all of those call districts, just having them come in. He didn't call a single CQ. This was using 100 watts and a seven-band wire antenna in some white pines in his backyard. Um, so, he says we small guns do have a chance under good conditions. My point to you is that this has science in it, and you're all capable of doing this. So, it's a really good example of encouraging you guys to go out and just make observations and record what you see. And through this network of, uh, that we're setting up, get this information out there, and then we can hook you to people who actually are plugging this into scientific studies. And just to tell you that 2016 wasn't a fluke, he sent me this message yesterday. This is the 17th of May, 2017. Look at that. And there's a vortex in the upper app, in the lower atmosphere, right about the place where all that sporadic is doing. So the more data you can collect, but I think there's a trend here. And I have a person who studies the neutral atmosphere, and she has for about 30 years. She's extremely interested in this. So, the conclusion is, it's still a random thing, it's, very, it's a lot of variables, but there's probably a lower atmosphere weather connection here. I think amateur radio is a perfect opportunity to see and document these by just paying attention to, where's the propagation today? Where can I contact? Where can I work? Um, sadly, North America might not be the best spot in the world, but that just means you have to be a little persistent, as Joe was. And so he says, don't pray for hurricanes and storms, just sitting <laughs> over <in> that. <laughs> And he's still alive. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> <laughs> so here's some reference links, and uh, this will be available on the slides. Um, like I said, this is Joe's work. Um, I think he's going to be happy to take questions. But like I've been saying several times, go out there and collect some data, and you'll be having fun with it at the same time. We're looking forward to it. Thanks a lot. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah, that's one of the things that I think this initiative hopes to do. And you can hear about the eclipse, okay, is another idea of going through log books and pulling this data out and applying it to diverse topics like this. So that's exactly what we'd like to do. One more question, yes? Any reason that you discovered why the wind changed direction? Ah, that is, an, uh, okay, so that is really an unknown thing yet because we honestly know the neutral wind pattern in the atmosphere, atmosphere so, know so little about them. So 
the frontier in making upper atmospheric measurements is not to do the climatology, to do the mean, to do the variability around the mean, because that's what weather is. And nobody lives at 100 kilometers that I know of, so it's really, really hard to get that data. Rockets spend about five minutes up and five minutes down, and they're done. You can't put a satellite there because it would re-enter like that. So this data that I'm just encouraging you to collect is really unique in that perspective. Thank you, Phil.